Welcome to this lecture on section 24J. Section 24J is a section that pops up quite a bit in our questions, but it is very, very, very simple. That is very similar to what you do in financial accounting and management accounting, but what I'm going to be focusing on a little bit here on the theory side of it is basically obviously building up to show you, as you can see from the definitions in the Act and how the Act is written to incorporate this in case you also have to do a discussion type question. But it's mostly asked as this um, calculations and the calculations are quite similar uh, or simple. Right, so basically what we're going to see in this situation is we are going to be looking at um, this section tells us what do we do with interest. If you receive interest or if you pay interest, how do we calculate this? Now, so this applies to both interest income and to the deduction section of it. So this section is actually, if you go look at the Act of Section 24J, it's actually a very complicated section. But it's important that you note that the majority of this section is excluded from your examinal pronouncements. So guys, please make sure that when you're looking at this section that you do not study this part of the Act which is excluded because it is quite challenging. Okay, so please make sure of that. So, Section 24J is the main section that tells us what to do with interest. Now, so far what we've done when we've calculated certain things in our questions so far, we've basically just assumed that we use the general deduction formula to deduct interest expenditure. So, if the, they tell you in a question that a company has incurred 5,000 rands of interest for the year, we usually just deduct it under Section 11A. But what we're going to see here is that actually Section 24J is probably going to be applicable, um, and that is especially for situations where there is a yield to maturity. And a yield to maturity, guys, is that I that you calculate. So I that you calculate on your financial calculator. All right, so the main sections which you have to just focus on to get first is section 24J2 and section 24J3. These are the sections that tell us when section 24J applies. Now, you'll see the terms that are used very often in these sections um, so, and these are very important is the terms issuer and the term holder. So you need to know what an issuer is and what is a holder. So a holder is the person who holds the instruments and who holds the benefits. So therefore that person is the person that will be receiving interest. And the issuer is the person who has issued the instrument, the person who will be liable for the interest. So the person who is going to be paying it. So for the holder, this is income. And for the issuer, this is an expense. So we can find the definitions of holder in section 24J1. And guys, don't be shy to look this up in an exam situation if you can't quickly remember. Under pressure, we do sometimes mess up. So I want you to see that a holder, they talk about an income instrument over here. And for an issuer, they talk about an instrument. We are going to be looking at the terms income instrument and instrument for in a second. For now, I just want you to focus on whether or not they pay, they're liable to pay, or um, whether interest has accrued to them. So, the holder means any person who has become entitled to any interest. Okay? And the issuer means any person who has incurred any interest. That's basically the most important part of it. So, then we are now going to be looking at the definitions of instrument and income instrument. Remember, we said instrument and income instrument. Now, we always start by looking at instrument because instrument and income instrument includes instruments. So, let's, look, let's see what instrument means. Again, it's defined in section 24J1. An instrument means any interest-bearing arrangement or debt and then any acquisition or disposal of any right to receive interest or obligation to pay interest. Okay, and then any repurchase or sale agreement, but excluding any lease agreement. The most important one here, guys, C. It is an interest bearing arrangement or debt. So what I want you to see is if there's a debt or any other sort of arrangement where interest is being charged, then it will be considered an instrument. So if I go to the bank and I take out a loan, so I have to pay interest in terms of the loan, that loan is an instrument. If I put money into the bank, a fixed deposit, and I earn interest, that is an instrument. Okay, so anything where there is interest. So what is an income instrument? An income instrument means, in the case of any person other than a company, right? So they say for people who are not 
companies, so i.e. natural persons. That's the most important one. But I'm also going to say plus trusts. So for natural persons and trusts, it is any instrument. So I want you to see, it is any instrument. And when I say instrument, I'm referring to the one we just looked at. So what is an interest in instrument again? Anything that has interest on it. So it is any instrument. And then where the term is likely to exceed one year. And where it is issued or acquired at a discount or a premium or bears deferred interest. Now, what does that mean? That means, for example, if there is a debenture that you are issuing and the debenture has a face value or a coupon value of 100,000 rand, so it's 100,000 rand debenture, but you issue it or purchase it, issue it for 90,000 rands, then it means it is issued at a discount. Okay? Or it can be issued, obviously, for 120,000 rands. Or it can be redeemed at the end of the debenture for a discount or at a premium, whatever the case might be. So basically, a discount or premium means that you pay or receive more or less than 100,000 rands. Okay, the face value. So it's the same as what you've studied so far. So for a company, for a person who is not a company, it means it must be for more than one year and they must be, it must be issued at a premium or at a discount. But in the case of a company, it is any instrument. So what does that mean? For a company, it means it is anything that has interest on it. So see now what this means if I take the two together. So instrument, let's look at instrument first. It doesn't say here if it's for a company or not a company. So an instrument for a natural person, a trust, and a company is anything that has interest on it, like we've seen over here. It's anything with interest on it. doesn't matter if it's a company. So this is for companies, natural persons, trusts, anyone, basically. So an instrument is anything that has interest on it. But an income instrument, if you're a natural person or a trust, it must be for more than one year, and it must have be issued at or redeemed at this kind of premium. But for a company and any instrument is also an income instrument. Okay, it's very, very, very important that you see that. So why is this important? Because of what Section 24J2 and 3 tells us. Section 24J2 says, if you are the issuer, so remember who's the issuer? The person liable to pay the interest. If you're liable to pay interest, then you will have to apply Section 24J whenever there is an instrument. So for natural persons, trust companies, anyone, an instrument. And an instrument is, again, anything of interest. But if you are the holder, um, you interest accrues to you. So when it's an income, then you will only apply Section 24J if it's an income instrument. So for a company, they will apply it at all times, Section 24J, whether or not they are paying or receiving it. But for a natural person, they will only, if they are receiving it, it must only be if it's an income instrument. And when is that income instrument again? More than one year or there's a discount or a premium. Okay, so very important. Over here, again, instrument. When you're paying, doesn't matter what the term is, doesn't matter if it's at a discount or a premium, but when it's an income instrument and you're a natural person, it must be for more than a year and discount or a premium. So here we'll just see what Section 24J2 now says. So remember, Section 24J is the one we just looked at, where you are the issuer and it's an instrument. So let's see it in the Act. It says, where any person is the issuer in relation to an instrument during any year of assessment. Okay? I'm just going to skip one slide down quickly. Section 24J3, where a person is the holder in relation to an income instrument. So there you can see the two sections telling us that. Okay, so let's look at what it says. So Section 24J2 says, where a person is the issuer in relation to an instrument during any year of assessment, such person shall, for the purpose of this act, be deemed to have incurred an amount of interest which is equal to the sum of 
all the accrual amounts in relation to all accrual periods, whether in whole or in part, within such a year of assessment, or they talk here something which is determined in terms of the alternative method. That has anything to do with the alternative method is excluded from your syllabus. So basically, if you are the issuer of an instrument, so remember anything of interest on it, then and the issuer is the person who is going to pay it, so they will treat you as if you've paid interest, which is equal to the accrual amounts. Okay, so we're going to see what an accrual amount is in a bit. An accrual amount is basically I on your financial calculator. And I tell you, and this must be deducted from the income of that person or carrying on of a trade, if it is in the production of income. When we look at section 24J3, we will now look at the holder. So again, this is only when there's an income instrument. So again, guys, an income instrument for company, everything that has interest, but for natural person or trust, only if it's more than a year, and only if it's issued or um, discount, issued at a discount or a premium. So it says, where the person is a holder, and remember also again, the holder is the person who's going to be receiving interest. They shall, for the purpose of this act, be deemed to have accrued to that person and an amount that has been included in the gross income of that person in the year of assessment. And they say whether or not that amount constitutes a receipt or accrual of capital nature. So they're trying to just make sure here that any interest that is on that will always be included in gross income. You can't argue that it is capital in nature. Now, if you remember also tree versus fruit, the FISA case, Interest can basically never be capital in any case. But this was just obviously written at a different time when there was a risk. So, and that interest must be equal to the sum of all the accrual amounts again. And then, again, they have this whole story about the alternative method. So, again, accrual amount. So, can you see, when you pay it, the amount that you've deemed to have incurred is the accrual amount. And it is also the accrual amount when you are receiving it. So again, that is I on your financial calculator. So we've now seen how to apply the accrual amount. Or we've seen that they noticed to us that we have to apply the accrual amount. So what is the accrual amount? So the accrual amount is defined in section 24J1. And they tell us the accrual amount in relation to an accrual period means an amount determined with the following formula. And this formula is A equals B times C. B is the yield to maturity. And this yield to maturity, this is I again. Basically, this is actually the amount that you use for I in your calculator. And then they say, and C is the adjusted initial amount. So it will be the interest rate times some sort of outstanding capital balance. That's basically what happens. That calculates the full accrual amount. Now, you'll see that they tell you here, there's a proviso, they say that if this interest falls over more than one year or within a year, you have to apportion this on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we will see this as we go along, what exactly we refer to here, but basically you can only include the interest for that year in your calculation. Okay, so, guys... Yield to maturity. Yield to maturity is the rate of compound interest per accrual period at which the present value of all amounts payable or receivable in relation to a holder of any uh, to a holder or an issuer, as the case may be, of such instruments in the term equals the initial amount. Now, basically, what they're trying to say here, and you remember, I said to you here, B is the yield to maturity, which is I. That is why they're saying here. It is the rate of compound interest. Now remember, guys, when you put I on your calculator, or in your calculator, when you do those calculations, we say N is so much, PV is so much, future value is so much, payment is so much, that I is the interest rate which basically spreads your interest over the period of this instrument. So you've seen it on the leases or the benches and so on. And that's what basically they're saying here. It's the interest rate 
which makes the present value of all the amounts which you're going to pay or receive equal to the initial amount. Okay, so that's exactly what an uh, I of the calculator is. Okay, and then you have initial amount. Initial amount on your calculator is the present value. And it says it's the issue price or the transfer price for an instrument. The adjusted initial amount. Now, whenever you guys do your calculators, so you say N is 3, for example, PV equals 100,000. Payment equals, uh, let's say, 40,000. And then we always say calculate or compute I. Now, when you do up your tables, there's usually, as you'll remember, if you do an amortization table where you have uh, capital or you have the payment, you have the interest, and you have the outstanding capital. Okay, so every year you pay 40,000 rands, you're going to say 30,000 of that interest is interest, and the outstanding capital amount is then 90 after year one. Then 40,000 rands in year two, I'm obviously just thumb sucking amounts here, guys, etc., and you continue. So basically, the adjusted initial amount is the capital amount outstanding at the end of the year. Now, you usually just calculate this in your computer. But again, you'll see the adjusted initial amount when you're looking at your lecture examples and how it works. So an adjusted initial amount, they say in relation to the holder of an income instrument or in relation to an issue of an instrument. You'll see they're exactly the same. Is the sum of the initial amount and the accrual amounts in relation to all previous accrual periods and any other payments made by such holder during such periods. Less any payments received by such a holder. Okay, if we look at B, the issue of an instrument, it is the sum of the initial amount and the accrual amounts in relation to all previous periods, less any payments made. Okay, so they have this whole discussion here, guys, which you can just read through. But basically what I want you to see, how that calculation works is they say you should do this calculation. You start at the initial amount, which is the present value. You will then add the accrual amount to that. So what is the accrual amount again? The accrual amount is where we do this calculation. A equals B times C. So B is the yield to maturity, remember? So the interest rate. And C is the adjusted initial amount. So, basically what they're saying here, this accrual amount here is the interest rate times the initial amount. Then, you will deduct any payments. This is PMT on your calculator. After doing that, you've got the adjusted initial amount. So, then you will just continue. You will then multiply the accrual amount again. So, that is I times the adjusted initial amount. Less the payment gives you the adjusted initial amount. Then again, plus the accrual amount, less the payment amount, and you continue until the lease or the debenture, or whatever the instrument is, has been settled. Okay, exactly the same as you've been doing it all along.